One of the little guys just walking out of here was sad because he's going to a new class. He likes his old one so well. How many think it's good when they, they like where they've been for a while? But I told him it might be better. You never know. Problems with consenting adults. <laughs> That's our topic today. And yes, it's going where you think it's going. A lot of people wonder what pastors do with all their time, uh, all this study, preparation for messages, and that's an important part. Of course, there's other responsibilities too, and among them are uh, times when you get together with someone for prayer and for pastoral counseling. I'm always honored when someone brings me into some of their more uh, challenging seasons of life, uh, and there'll be conversations about mistakes that have been made or fears that seem to be paralyzing them or sorrows that just seem to weigh them down and they're not sure that the future is ever going to get any better. And it's not uncommon for people to find courage to talk about their sins that they've committed. When it comes to sex, I hear a lot of the stories that are different from the stories that are told in locker rooms, buses, and water coolers. The ones that I hear usually involve uh, painful, shameful, and hurtful realities. And uh, the truth is, is we say our culture uses sex to sell everything. I think our culture uses everything to sell sex. Uh, you've probably seen those commercials for medications on television where the last portion is someone speeding up their conversation very quickly and going through all of the side effects that this medication could have. How many have ever listened to some of those side effects and wondered who would take that drug? <laughs> so here's an example, all right? See if you can guess what this is for. Side effects of this uh, drug can include depression, mood swings, trouble concentrating, sleep problems, crying spells, aggression, agitation, changes in behavior, hallucinations, thoughts of suicide or hurting yourself, sudden numbness or weakness, especially on one side of your body, blurred vision, sudden and severe headache or pain behind your eyes, sometimes with vomiting, hearing problems, hearing loss, ringing in your ears, seizures, severe pain in your upper stomach, spreading to your back, nausea and vomiting, fast heart rate, loss of appetite, dark urine, clay-colored stools, jaundice, severe diarrhea, rectal bleeding, fever, chills, body aches, flu symptoms, purple spots under your skin, easy bruising or bleeding or joint stiffness, bone pain or fracture. That medication is to clear up acne. <laughs> How bad is that pimple, really? <laughs> Our culture sells sex all the time, but they never list the side effects. And I need to start by saying that I'm not of the opinion that God or the church is or needs to be embarrassed about human sexuality. In fact, it actually was God's idea. He created it. The question I want to address today is, does the church have any right to weigh in on human sexuality and what is appropriate behavior? And Paul does in the passage that we're looking at. And we're going to be very surprised by the observations that he makes. He gives directions to the church that will surprise us today. And uh, so this is how the passage starts in 1 Corinthians 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. Uh, this was a young man in the church in Corinth. Uh, this was his stepmother. His father was still alive, and his family was very, very wealthy, kind of celebrity status. So the church wasn't addressing this issue because they were afraid they would lose a prominent member and the contributions that went along with them. What you might not know is how the laws of that time actually thought about behavior like this. Sometimes we think that ancient laws didn't deal with any such thing. They did. The Roman law said that if a person was indicted for the combined crime of adultery and incest, uh, 
that there was no leniency to be shown. They were to be permanent, be put in permanent exile. They would lose their citizenship as a Roman and all the property that they owned. And there was no statute of limitations on this crime. If it happened 25 years ago, they could still punish you for it. Under Roman law, however, the only person that could bring that charge against this young man would have been his father. And he wasn't doing it. And the question is why. Maybe he just was so ashamed by what was happening in his family, he didn't want it to be public. Or maybe he was just concerned about losing his public dignity. We don't know, but what we do know is that Paul says the church needs to respond to something like this. And here's the challenge. When it comes to talking about human sexuality, our culture is pretty much tired of what the church has had to say. In fact, our culture will usually say the church has had too much to say on this topic. So let's look at some of the surprising things Paul tells us. This is going to, you will be very surprised. The first is this. The church is not called to tell the unchurched how to behave. The church is not called to tell the unchurched how to behave. It is not our job to tell people how to behave before they believe. And yet the church often spends a lot of its time and energy trying to do that. Let me show you this in Scripture. It says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy or the swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave the world. How many know? There, our world is filled full of people who get it wrong. And Paul said, when I said not to associate with people, he said, I wasn't talking about people in the world. That's not even possible. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, but is sexually immoral or, what's the next word? Greedy, an idolater, slanderer, drunkard, swindler. Do not even eat with such a person. We're going to come back to that because that's a big deal. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? If you have a Bible, you might want to underline that passage. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? When did it become our job to tell people how to behave before they believe? Paul said, it's not our job. Are you not to judge those inside? That's a different question. God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. What business is it of mine? It is not our job to tell people how to behave before they believe. That's not the role of the church. Second point, surprising direction by the Apostle Paul, is that the church is not called to run away from the unchurched. This is a really big deal, too. He says, I'm not telling you you should try to avoid them. You'd actually have to leave the world. We are called to be salt. We are called to be light. A light that is hidden or salt that is isolated has lost its purpose, and it is useless in the world. Our responsibility is to interact with the world in such a way that they can witness the grace of God in our lives. The temptation for the church has less to do with sexuality and more to do with separation. We want to separate ourselves whose behavior offends us. And can I tell you what one of the dirty secrets about Christianity is? Most of the time, we try to change the rules of the culture because we feel we can't tolerate the temptation ourselves. We have to change the environment because we don't think we're strong enough to navigate it. This is a real challenge. So they want to separate. This causes attitudes of judgmentalism and condemnation. And Paul just tells them, stop trying to discipline the world by imposing Christian standards on them. Their lives haven't been transformed by grace. If we could change our lives without the grace of God, Jesus would not have needed to come to begin with. That's where it starts. So the as a believer, we have a responsibility to enter our world as a witness of the grace of God. Live our lives with the kind of freedom and joy and wholeness and healthiness that people are actually interested in how we're able to navigate life like this. 
There's a, a, a quarterback that I know. He's a famous quarterback in the NFL, and he was living with someone who was not his wife. It's not that uncommon in the NFL. They had a babysitter. He and his girlfriend had a babysitter for the children that they had. The babysitter was a member of one of our Assembly of God churches, and she would just go and take care of the children. And one day, this girlfriend said to her, do you have a boyfriend? And she said, yes, I do. And she, said, she started asking questions about how he is in bed. And she says, well, I don't know the answer to that yet. We're engaged to be married, but we've not uh, slept together yet. We've not had sex yet. She was astonished. Well, why wouldn't you do that? And that little girl from an Assembly of God church spent the the next few minutes talking about how that her sexual life was not a commodity to be put on display or sold at the cheapest, most convenient price, but that rather she was saving herself because she thought that the person who was going to experience the deepest levels of her intimacy should be willing to make the highest levels of commitment. That's all she said. She didn't say a thing about anybody else. A week later, that quarterback and his girlfriend were engaged to be married. <laughs> That's the influence of grace. We're trying to control people instead of witnessing to them. There's a difference. So we are called to live as a witness. Now, here's the challenge. When it comes to sex, sex isn't just sex. The whole world understands that. And when people engage in sexual activity, there's always more involved than just some kind of pleasure exchange that occurred. But Paul surprises us by other things that he adds in here. He talks about greediness. Greediness is more than just loving money. It's actually trying to enrich yourself unfairly. It's, it's disregarding those who have less and taking advantage of them so that you can get more. And here's the challenge. Where's the church been on the topic of greediness? And you say, well, it's not so important in our culture. Right. <laughs> no greediness happening in our culture at all. I wonder if we talked more about that if we wouldn't be more credible on other things when we talk about them. Third direction that Paul gives us is kind of surprising. The church is called to address sinful behavior among its members. Now, this is what's interesting. The tendency of the church today is to rail against a culture that doesn't belong, but to ignore the stuff that happens inside the doors. And Paul seems to use some fairly harsh language and some harsh responses. Let's look at some of this. He says, you are proud. Shouldn't you have rather gone into mourning and have put out of the fellowship the man who has been doing this? That's a pretty harsh response. Hand this man over to who? How many of you would be troubled today if I stood up and said, uh, this is so-and-so? We're turning him over to Satan today. Don't let this happen to you. I mean, this is, what is he saying here? This is really challenging. Like, when, when you're responsible to teach passages like this, this is the hard stuff. These are the passages I would rather avoid. Let's just go straight to the one God so loved the world. Let's leave out this one out where turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. Oh, my God goodness, what's going on here? Well, important things are happening here. He says not even to eat with them, and what he's saying is it's not about you're not allowed to have a meal with them, meet them for breakfast, or have dinner together. It's a specific reference in the context of this passage It shows up to the Lord's Supper, to communion. You see, in the ancient world, they celebrated communion a little bit different than we do, and I'm going to talk more about that in just a minute. But communion was intended to sensitize us to our need for grace and the work of God's Spirit in us. And they were getting it exactly the opposite. They were using communion to desensitize a person. We're going to see how that is. But it raises an interesting question. Because if he's saying, don't let this person partake of communion, does it mean you have to be perfect in order to partake of communion? And that's this direction. The availability of communion is not limited to perfect people. If it was, none of us could partake of it. Communion is the time where you actually recognize your failings and your frailties. It's where you realize fresh and anew, I need the grace of God in my life. I need the forgiveness that he offers and the healing 
that he brings. Now, some people do not approach communion that way. Some people are proud of their behavior. They have no tolerance for anyone that would try to warn them or instruct them about their out-of-bounds behavior. They're unconcerned about how their actions have affected others. In fact, they will often say things like, the only one I'm hurting is myself. They don't even think they need grace because they don't think they've done anything wrong. And Paul wants us to know for that person, communion has no effect on them. They've been desensitized to its purpose, its intent, and its work. So Paul doesn't say to the church, you need to give this guy the cold shoulder. He's saying, don't get so intertwined with his life that you lose your objectivity. You can no longer speak. Remember, this is a very wealthy person. And so being around this person would give you certain advantages. Being near this person would give you access to certain things. And Paul is saying, don't intertwine your life so much that you lose your objectivity and you can't speak the truth in love. And then he says that phrase, deliver him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. So what's he saying here? Well, he's not calling for the death of this person. In fact, flesh here is not a physical thing. Uh, we talked about this in the first couple of chapters that we looked at in 1 Corinthians because Paul talks about them being very fleshly or very carnal or very worldly. This has to do with a stubborn orientation, an opposition to correction or to change. It's, it's the attitude of your heart. It's where someone says, I don't care if what I'm doing is considered wrong by you. And Paul says, this person needs to be resensitized to the working of the Holy Spirit. That leads us to the last direction that the apostle gives. And after these five directions, I'm going to have one observation. But the goal of addressing sinful behavior is to see a person reconnected to grace and restored to community. See, sometimes we just get embarrassed about people. We don't want our reputation to be sullied, and so we just want them out of the room. We want them off the grounds. We want them out of our lives. And the purpose of dealing with issues like this in the church is to not get rid of problems. The way we go about dealing with these is intended to reconnect the person to grace and reintroduce them to community. And if that's your goal, the way you go about it will actually be quite different. Paul uses this phrase in 1 Corinthians 5. He says, your boasting is not good. Don't you know that little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? He uses this concept of yeast because all sin affects others. The, the great deception about sin is the only, thing I, the only one I'm hurting is myself. It's never, sin is never a private matter. It always hurts someone else. Same for this guy. This young man's behavior wasn't just between himself and his stepmother. This young man was affecting his father. He was affecting his family. He was affecting the community of faith in Corinth. So that brings us to this, where Paul turns a corner now and he says something really powerful. He says, for Christ, our Passover lamb. Why is he all of a sudden talking about Christ, our Passover lamb? Why does he turn this corner? We're, we're talking about human sexuality. We're talking about out-of-bounds behavior. We're talking about the church's response. We're talking about appropriate reactions and responses to it. And, and then he goes, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You see, when we come to the Lord's table, the way we do it is it's a small piece of bread and a small cup of juice. The Corinthian church didn't celebrate the Lord's table with small doses of bread and wine. They, they celebrated the Lord's table with a feast. I mean, they would go all out. And so when Paul is saying don't eat with them, that's what he's talking about. Don't, don't participate in this great feast because it's desensitizing him to what God wants to do in his life. When we come to the Lord's table, we're actually supposed to come, we'll get to it in 1 Corinthians 11, but a person should examine themselves. There's questions we should be asking ourselves. Am I teachable? Am I humble? Am I correctable? Is there stubbornness in my heart? Have I wronged anyone? And am I taking steps to try to remedy that? Has someone wronged me? And have I taken steps to speak truth and love to them? 
You see, when a church does this, it becomes a self-correcting ecosystem where we're constantly admonishing, encouraging, and speaking to each other in ways that keep us on a healthy path. God has not called us to hide our failures. There is no benefit to everyone pretending we're better than we are. And in lots of religious environments, the goal is to not reveal what's going on in our heart or what's going on in the building outside of these walls, in our lives outside of these walls. And God crashes through on that, and he says, no, you're, you're supposed to confess those things. We're supposed to call attention in each other's lives to the things that might be hindering or limiting us. And we should encourage each other to work out what Christ is working in us. This Corinthian church was in a complete crisis. They thought that the rules were different if you had more or if you were celebrity status. If you're rich enough, if you're well-known enough, then the rules don't apply to you. And Paul knew that that would destroy a family and a church. So he brings them back to this understanding of communion. Christ, our Passover lamb. You see, communion is supposed to, to be a jolt that wakes us up from our sin coma. It's supposed to remind us. It's supposed to challenge us to any indifference that we have in our own heart. So Christ has been sacrificed for us. See, thousands of years ago, there was a nation that had been made slaves by another nation, Egypt had taken Israel, the nation of Israel, and turned them into slaves. And they had hard tasks, and they drove them uh, all day long, every day of the week. And the weight of that slavery and the pain of that slavery had hardened Israel's heart, too. You can only tolerate something like that for so long before something in you starts getting really hard. And so God was going to resolve this issue. He was going to send a destroyer, and the destroyer would strike their captors and set them all free. There was a problem, though, with this idea. The problem was is that the destroyer, when it was targeting oppressive, stubborn, and unjust behavior, it couldn't discern the difference between ethnicity. It wasn't just targeting unjust Egyptians. Everywhere there was an unjust, oppressive Hard, heart. The destroyer would move towards it. It couldn't distinguish the difference. And so any Israelite whose heart was heart or was oppressive towards other people or treated anyone with injustice, they were at risk that day. And so God created an option for them. What they could do is they could take a lamb and they could slay it and they could take the blood of that lamb and they could paint it on the doorframe of their house and then when the destroyer came by, the destroyer would know that destruction has already come to this house and it would not need to stay there. And it would pass over. That's where the term Passover comes from. The destroyer would pass over that house and go to the next house. The blood sacrifice, that blood sacrifice was the substitute. Thousands of years later, it actually happens again. Destruction is going to come to our world for everyone who's hard-hearted and stubborn and unjust. And someone intervened one more time. There would be the blood of another substitute. It was Christ, our Passover. That's why when we celebrate communion, we know we're not perfect. That's what communion says. Communion is not the reward for being good. Communion is the cup of grace for those who recognize they need it. That's the difference. So when we come to the Lord's table and we celebrate communion, we recognize, I'm not perfect. It's a recognition that I've made mistakes. It's a confession that there's parts of me that are hard and stubborn and have acted out of bounds. It's admitting that we need a substitute. I can't fix this all by myself. And for the person who comes to the Lord's table, who accepts what Christ offers, they never need fear the judgment of God. Sure, God will discipline them. God will correct them. God will instruct them, but never to destroy them always to help them. Communion, when you partake of communion, what you're saying is, I am no better than anybody else. That's when communion does its work. If we come into the house of God and we think this is reserved for the good people, 
then we do a great disservice to what Christ accomplished on the cross, and we send a very unfortunate message to a lost and a dying world. We are not better than them. We are the same as them. We needed a substitute because we couldn't fix this ourselves. And now not only has he worked forgiveness into our hearts, but his grace is transforming our lives day by day by day. Don't you want a church that believes that? And don't you want a church that protects its members? Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. We don't talk a lot about this, but this stuff happens around here. So there was a person one time who was attending our church. They had a very significant drug habit, and they would ingratiate themselves and be friendly on Sundays and get invitations to people's houses. And when they would go into their houses, they were stealing things from them, cash out of their purses and wallets, things out of their house so that they could feed their drug habit. And we became aware of that. How many think that the church probably ought to say something about that, the leadership? And we did. We addressed that. We held the person accountable. We offered help, but we also said this can't happen anymore. They decided to go someplace else. Their heart was hardened. They didn't want help. They wanted opportunity. And the leadership here takes that very seriously. We don't think that we're just supposed to be vulnerable, gullible individuals who let people feed off of us so that they can destroy their lives and others. There's another person who came into our church. You probably don't know that this happens every once in a while, not often, thankfully, but occasionally a person will come in who's been found guilty of inappropriate behavior with a minor. Uh, we don't announce this on a Sunday, but we talk to the person and we establish very clear boundaries. There's only one service that they're allowed to attend. They're not allowed to go into the restrooms or into our children's hallway, and there's video surveillance throughout our entire facility. We will know if they do. When they come, they have to come on time. They have to leave on time. They have to sit with an elder, and they have to notify that elder when they arrive, and they have to stay with that elder for the entire time in their service. And what I can tell you is I've had mixed responses to those requirements. I've had people look at me and say, where's the grace? Where's the grace? I thought this was a Christian church. Can I just tell you, in my experience, every time somebody says that, they're not looking for grace, they're looking for opportunity. And you will not get that here. The most precious treasure Christ ever entrusted to any of our lives is those children down the hall. And we're going to do everything we can to protect them. Does that make sense? There have been times when we realized that a person couldn't live by those uh, rules, and we've told them. We said, look, uh, we live stream our services. You're going to attend our church on live stream, and then we will arrange a regular discipleship meeting with a pastor or with an elder so that you can continue your spiritual growth. But you are not at a place where it is safe for you to be part of our church family yet. Don't you want a church that takes that seriously? And the thing is, it would be very easy for us to ignore that stuff and appear to be righteous by how we rail against a culture that does not yet believe, but we want them to behave. That's not church. That's not pastoring. That's not leadership. And it's not what God has called us to do. God has called us in this house to be a safe place where people can find real faith, real friends, and a real future. Amen? Let's bow our heads this morning. Um, you're, you might be sitting here going, oh, oh no, what if they find out something about me? Um, first of all, God already knows. And secondly, we're not here to hurt. We're here to help bring healing and wholeness. That's our goal. The purpose of addressing these issues, Paul made crystal clear, is about reintroducing someone to grace and reintegrating them into the community of faith. That this is the most astonishing truth of the gospel. Is that no matter what you've done or how many times you've done it, the grace of God can reach you 
It's going to require that you set aside your right to defend your behavior and your actions. It's, it's going to require a recognition that you're not just hurting yourself. There's other people who are paying a very dear price when we step out of bounds. When you open your life to the correcting work of God, what you're surprised by is his love and his grace. He will not leave us to our own destructive devices. He calls us to a different life, not so that we can appear to be better than someone else, but so that we can actually experience a better life than the one we've been living. It's the most astonishing thing when we actually get his will for us instead of our will for us. So, Father, help us today. We struggle with these things. We are not a perfect people. When we come to communion, we're reminded of that. It's your grace that has substituted for us. It's your grace that has made payment for us. It's your grace that is transforming us. And we are so grateful for that. So would you help us encourage each other, instruct each other, even when necessary, warn each other, so that we can walk in ways that allow your grace to flow freely, not only into our lives, but through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together this morning.